Okay. Uh, Revive Studios. So uh, I've seen you have a sermon before, and you're like, listen, I've got like days left for this sermon to be sent to the reader. And you, you've, you've got words in there with N's that are F's and T's that are H's. Yeah. What, what's, what's the prep process for you? Yeah, so for every episode of Revive Thoughts, um, which is you know different than our other podcasts, we are getting sermons from the past, and those are usually written in Old King's English, but you don't want to listen to Old King's English. That would be very boring for you, or you'd have to have a lot of patience. And our show actually has found it does really, really well with English as second language learners because they want mm. to listen to Interesting. Puritans or old people or whatever, St. Augustine, but they can't, it's very difficult for somebody from the Philippines who speaks English, but not as a first language to listen to thee, thy, thou, you know, Aoist and all that stuff. Well, we edit all the sermons, we modernize it, we try to make it sound as if you were listening to a live sermon being preached. And we've had many people, this is the whole goal, and when they say this, this is awesome, but they say, wow, it's like I'm sitting in the pew, it's just the person preaching is, you know, 800 years old and they died a long time ago. And I'm like, that's exactly what we wanted it to feel like when you listen to the show. And that's especially great for people, again, who are young. We have middle schoolers and high schoolers who said they listen to our show. We have people who are quite elderly who can't get out and about. We have professors, pastors, uh, radio hosts, people from around the world. And it's just such a unique, the series does not appeal to one group. You know, when we first started it, we were told like, hey, professors and academia will love that show. And I was like, I, I hope you're wrong. Like, I hope it's actually not... Um, just really popular with this one niche group of people. If anything, the professors in academia are the ones who have problems with us. It's most <laughs> the average people really enjoy it, and they like the fact that it is, you know, it, it, it takes the editing. And it's sometimes, I mean, I don't know if you've ever read a book by a Puritan or you've ever read anything by Jonathan Edwards. I just recently cut an 85-page sermon down to 40 pages, and you're probably thinking, oh, you deleted 50% of the content. I assure you, he was just repeating himself. <laughs> um, and finding, <laughs> and the you know, finding a very long... <laughs> Yeah, and I'm finding a very long-winded way to say the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I look at our edits much more like in the Bible when we when we you know take a manuscript, we should. I'm a big NASB ESV. Like I want it direct, and I want it as God wrote it. I'm not really interested in the message. But when it comes to sermons, our editing is much more the message style. Where we're making it very easy to enjoy. We don't, I promise you, I don't change what they're saying. I never took something and thought, oh, I'd like it if he said that more Calvinistically. Or I like it if he'd say that less charismatically. Like those things don't happen. Um, but I do make it a little bit more easy to digest because sometimes, you know, there are times too where like they'll be mentioning somebody in the sermon. Like I've had people where they'll start talking to a person in the pew and I'm like, I'm not going to keep that because we don't know what happened to old Zedekiah the third <laughs> and we're, he, we're not in his church anymore. So we don't need to worry about that. But some of these sermons, we're quite blessed to be able to say like we have literally pulled some out of the catacombs of history. Uh, we have two different sermons by David Livingston that we we contacted the Livingston Foundation. They're like, he only has two speeches he ever did. We put them together, edited them like they were quite literally on a shelf in a library, George Matheson, there's a lot. One was literally a book that was inside of an Australian library. They had it publicly available for a few months and they pulled it. So you literally, the only place in the world you can get that sermon is from us. Like there are just things like that where quite, the world would have forgotten them. And then we kind of were able to scoop in and bring them back to life. And those are my absolute favorite things to do because I truly feel like we're helping give these people a voice again. And people, you're, you would be blown away how much a sermon from 800 years ago hits you today and how much you'll go, wow, that was very convicting. And, and it's weird because on the one hand, like the sermon doesn't sound that different than a sermon you'd hear today. Like listening to it, you go, that doesn't sound that different. I, if you had told me this was somebody down the street, I wouldn't have known. And yet I feel like these sermons just have a way of being courageous and uncompromising that I think sometimes we lose today. And so even though they don't sound that different, the truths they're hitting, I think hit pretty hard. Yeah, uh, the one of them that I read, uh, Gregory of Anansi, uh, I believe it was uh, 800 AD, uh, some, somewhere around there. No, maybe, it's maybe uh, before like that, 300, 300 AD. 300, 300 yeah. AD. The, the, the love that he has for the church, uh, the, 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 the passion that he has for their sanctification, and uh, it, was, it was just done, uh, you know, in, 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 like in, in a grassy field, and he's preaching this, this kind of sermon of, of dedication. Uh, I, I, was, I was amazed at how passionate— uh, it was because you think ye of old, you know, they're they're staunch people. They they they've they've got no fire in their belly for for anything that, uh, you know, they're they're just trying to live to the next meal. 
but uh, the, the the joy that he had, and I I, I always take two two reads uh, when I do it. I, I always you know read it to myself, then I do a a, a prep and and find the inflections. And that one I had to to really undo and go, okay, he's he's I I feel like he has more more uh, love in his in his heart and his words of of dedication uh, of going through that, and that was really interesting to see. Or or uh, getting the collection of John Gill's uh, uh, s- sermons because I I found his one just let's remember this uh, 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 terrible uh, event that happened that that yeah. caused uh, destruction to England and that there are still some survivors with us today and we're remembering that um, j- just his passion for his church for remembering that for um, for for tying it to scripture and saying you know uh, in, in the storms God can be trusted um, I. I had no clue who John Gill was. I didn't realize how influential he was within the the scope of 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 even uh, you know the the with, with anybody. There's always problems with everybody. Uh, but uh, but I was trying to find his church, and it's just some parking lot now. And just the, those those uh, those those yeah. moments of like finding that person that kind of speaks to you within within history is is really neat. And uh, it's made me spend a lot more money. So uh, my my wife doesn't thank you at all. <laughs> No, it's actually really interesting that you made that point too, that his church is a parking lot now, because that's something else. So many of the people, A, I constantly find people, I'm like, I have no idea who this is. And then I look a little bit more into them and I'm like, oh, they're really important. But (laughs) then again, like that actually happens to me in real life too. Like we had Dr. Oz Guinness on. And to me, I just was like, oh, cool. He's the great grandson of Henry Grattan Guinness and he's a speaker. I'm going to have him on. And later on, people were like, you know, he's like a really big deal. Like he's got a bunch of books. He's been on a bunch of radio programs. Like he's a really old school legend. And I was like, oh, well, to me, he's the great grandson of Henry Guyton Guinness. And that was why I had him on. And OK, well, now I feel lame for not knowing how important he was. Um, and we're going to have him on again, too, again soon. So I'm looking forward to that. But right. yeah, so that's I mean, that's not just dead people. I do that with living people as well. Um, 